On behalf of His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, I welcome everyone to the third evening and final webinar of our Halki Summit. I think I'm going to miss this. It's been fun, and I wish it wouldn't be over. It's been more than a series of webinars. It felt more like a conversation, which literally means an intimate gathering of friends, people leaning in or zooming in to listen to the voice of others. Ultimately, of course, it's all about people. As the novel coronavirus affects the lives of millions of people throughout the world, rising above national boundaries and racial differences, it has invariably left an indelible mark on matters of public health and mental health. What is the importance of coordination and cooperation, of mandatory lockdowns, of social distancing, as well as your leadership and support? And what's the trade-off between health and economy? What is the appropriate response to, and what have we learned about the need to care for people? The crisis that we face has wrought havoc on the planet and on communities but particularly to the healthcare system and caregivers. We've learned the hard way, perhaps, that we are all interconnected, that we can't deny the impact of disease, just as we can't deny the impact of climate change. And indeed, we can only respond together in solidarity, not alone. We've heard that expressed so eloquently, so frequently over the last couple of nights. And we've been compelled to remember our mortality, that we can no longer act like immortal tyrants or arrogant cavaliers in our treatment of others as in our behavior toward nature. Living at the expense of others and the planet is not only morally wrong, but perilously self-destructive. The Greek word, as you know, for crisis implies judgment. We will be judged on the way we address these issues. We will be judged on the way we respond to these issues. We're accountable for the degree or rejection of our social and ecological responsibility. In fact, we've seen COVID-19 bring out the very best and the very worst in human behavior. Only today we heard of the brazen injustice and immorality of a hospital in the state of Washington, where wealthy donors were given priority for vaccination and then, oops, the hospital apologized. And we've tragically tolerated the exposure of low income people of color, grocery store workers, cleaners, and bus drivers, all the while securing for ourselves a sense of guiltlessness and deflecting our own responsibility by calling them essential workers or heroes even, instead of speaking of what is just and fair. COVID-19 has exposed these inequalities, these injustices. It has revealed just how much we depend on healthcare workers and teachers and manufacturers who bear the weight disproportionately and whom we fail to reward proportionately. Much like our response to climate change that we've talked about in the last two webinars, the areas of health care and mental health care demand more than just short-term solutions, but fundamental changes of attitude and infrastructure. It is, for instance, time to address the separate and unequal health system, as well as the question of health insurance. When added to this harsh and even unethical situation, COVID-19 becomes a deadly, predictable disaster. I'm very happy to mention that the Ecumenical Patriarchate has undertaken another initiative during this period to reach out to clergy and others in the healing ministry through its Network for Pastoral Healthcare, which has been holding weekly webinars during this period open to the wider community. One man in Greece has stood out, Sotiris Siodras. Greece's most prominent and highly respected epidemiologist, 
graciously accepted to deliver a pre-taped message for us. I recall an early interview of his soon after the pandemic broke, where Professor Tsiodras offered a very moving confession when asked if he was afraid of the virus. I am afraid, he responded, of being stigmatized, of distinguishing between infected and uninfected people. I am afraid of conspiracy theories and of embracing the partial, not the whole truth, or even worse, of endorsing a lie. I am afraid of not having the patience to debate and converse with science, of clinging to my own ideology. I am afraid of death, but I hope for another life. I am not so much afraid of death from the virus, but of spiritual death, of dying without being able to read a book or a poem, without being able to weep or sing or listen to invigorating music, detect spiritual fragrances or be capable of loving. I think that against all this, we should counterbalance solidarity, the need for constant search of truth and the reassessment of our life through this entire experience. We must reevaluate ourselves, not individualistically, but in order to see ourselves as part of a whole. When I read these words, uh, I knew we had to secure him for the work of the Patriarchate. So it is my honor now to present his reflections for our Halki Summit. Good day to all and greetings from the Ministry of Health from Greece. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me to deliver the short presentation during the Halki Summit 4 webinar entitled COVID-19 and Health, Mental Health. I would like to extend my greetings to all Greeks attending and wish everybody a better 2021 with the blessings of our ecumenical patriarch. Greece passed through the first phase of the pandemic lightly compared to some other European countries. The first phase of the pandemic was a tremendous success for our country and a good example for the world. It was a good starting point in this continuing struggle against the pandemic, a struggle that reminds us of a marathon run. People in Greece religiously obeyed the tough measures. It was partly due to the fear of the unknown, but good communication, answering basic questions about the virus, its spread and the effects, both at the personal and societal level, that greatly helped. The public's response was not just crucial. It also revealed the true character of our people, our nation, our spiritual strength, our recognition of the truth and the sense of the people for, of personal responsibility. It was a triumph of the Greek spirit. We were all heroes in that success. My contribution was to defend the truth in front of the cameras. Nevertheless, I never felt unique. I felt as a part of the whole. We all fought together. I tried to explain to the people the need to understand scientific uncertainty and our efforts as scientists to overcome it. I think more people now understand the scientific agony for the truth. After the summer, the virus transmission that had never disappeared picked up again and we started seeing a second wave of infections that peaked in October and November in our country and several countries around the world. Some of this spread continues and has escalated to a third wave in several countries in Europe and elsewhere. This virus eruption has resulted again in a significant number of people affected and a significant loss of human life. In addition, it has led to the reinstitution of harsh lockdowns that still continue or are extended in several countries around the world. Among these difficult measures implemented by states and leaders around the world, 
are school closures, cancellations of gatherings, including church ceremonies that are held with a maximum number of participants and with the use of strict hygienic protocols. We, scientists, call these actions non-pharmaceutical interventions. They can become tiring, but are nevertheless essential in stopping the virus at its tracks. Social distancing is now a regular term. Hand washing is necessary. Travel restrictions are implemented. Virtual conferences, like the one we're having, are things we have learned to live with. The highly debated mask issue has now become obsolete. We need the masks to reduce transmission. Increasingly, more people adhere to wearing them. It was hard at the beginning to accept them, especially during church services. The effects of the pandemic and the measures are not only physical, but mental as well. Anxiety about the future is predominant. A sense of vulnerability is prominent. The faith of the people has been challenged by a microscopic virus. Society and economy suffer altogether. Over the recent months, things have continued to escalate and several new challenges emerged. People are now tired, mentally, more than physically. Some of the uncertainties continue. We still do not have a great therapeutic regimen against the virus. We already enjoy the advantage of modern medical science by the development of a safe and efficacious vaccine in record time, less than a year. This is an amazing scientific feat. We do have the hope of extensive vaccine use by the majority of people. The vaccines, however, still come at limited quantities and immunization continues among logistical hurdles at a big part of the world and in our home country, Greece. Broad population coverage will ensure herd immunity that is widely seen as a way to free our society from lockdowns and a way to kickstart the economy again. On the other hand, the pandemic may not evolve as we wish. We hear about virus evolution, about mutations and variants that could potentially make us vulnerable again. Science will act as a catalyst in addressing some of the future uncertainties. It still remains a tough journey. We need to continue collaborating and working together the public, the scientists, the state, the church, the religious leaders. The advice to the public is to try to adhere to the difficult measures, to be patient. It's important to avoid stigma, the distinction between infected and non-infected people. Solidarity will get us through this. We're part of a whole in this endeavor. I wear the mask, I'm immunized, and I save the person next to me from pneumonia and possibly death, from a tiny microscopic virus, from a tiny microscopical particle that I don't see it, it, and it may not even affect me personally. I feel blessed having already received the complete vaccine schedule. I hope you, we all get immunized. Currently, it's our best shot in ending this. It's the light in the tunnel. The advice of the scientists should continue to fall in the receptive ears. We should continue to be well informed about fake news and conspiracy theories about the virus and the vaccine. Some people still don't believe that the virus exists. I'm afraid of people uploading half-truths, of people uploading lies. I'm afraid of people becoming fixated in their beliefs. The virus evolves. We, as scientists, will continue to follow. We will use our enhanced surveillance tools, testing, contact tracing, research on therapies. We will continue to fight it without prejudice and respecting our fellow humans and their rights. Yes, it's true that we may need a new vaccine in the future if the virus evolves. Yes, it's true that the virus may stay with us for the foreseeable future. We answer that we will not let our guard down. We will continue to keep our stand as scientists. We will fight to the end. Church and religious leaders should be sharing with the faithful evidence-based information about the new pandemic, 
about preparedness and response via a set of well-known to all of us measures. At this point, until we reach herd immunity by immunization, it's essential to avoid large group gatherings, to ensure that any decision to convince such group gatherings for worship is based on a sound risk assessment and in line with guidance from national and local authorities. Only then we will have safe, faith-based gatherings and ceremonies. The Church should address stigma, violence and the incitement of hate and should promote a peaceful coexistence during this pandemic. The Church should participate in sharing and ensuring that accurate information is shared with communities and actively engage in countering and addressing misinformation. Science and religion pursue and agonize about the truth in our life. As written in the Gospel, the truth shall make you free. Religion continues to be a cornerstone of many people's lives as they struggle to understand this pandemic of severe disease, of deaths, of awful outcomes. Religion and science should be allies in this fight against the pandemic virus. It's not hypocritical to pray for good health while at the same time taking all necessary measures and precautions advised by public health authorities. At this time of crisis, religion and science can walk together in the search for truth. Reinforcing public health messages during the current pandemic is the way forward. In my humble opinion, it's a noble and spiritual action that can strengthen the faith of the people. Thank you very much. Greetings from Greece. Professor Tsiodras's words set the tone for this final webinar. Let me introduce this evening's special guests. His Eminence Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago graduated from Hellenic College and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. He holds a master's in Christian ethics and a doctorate in bioethics from Boston University. He also studied at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. He has lectured at Fordham University, Holy Cross School of Theology, and St. Vladimir's Theological Seminary. Lieutenant Commander Sandra Mathusla is a United States Public Health Service pharmacist officer serving as a program management officer in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau's division. Previously, she was stationed at the Federal Medical Center of Fort Worth as a senior staff pharmacist, and she was deployed to Liberia on Monrovia Medical Unit Team 1 as part of the response team for the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And George Stavros is a licensed psychologist, training and later working at the Danielson Institute of Boston University, while serving as the Institute's Executive Director since 2009. He studied at Holy Cross Creek Orthodox School of Theology, and he completed his PhD at Boston University. He worked as, as a psychologist at Two Brattle Center in Cambridge, where he also served as director of its evening intensive outpatient program. Welcome to all of you. Sandra, let me begin with you and let's take up where Dr. Tsiodras left off. Before the vaccines arrived, mainstream media coverage on preventing the spread of the novel coronavirus was almost solely focused on wearing a mask, avoiding large gatherings and keeping a safe distance from others. Today, 10 months into the pandemic, do you have any other recommendations or suggestions on what we could be doing to protect ourselves from the virus? Yes, Father John, thank you for that question. Um, something I have been thinking about since the beginning of the pandemic is how mainstream media mass missed a very massive opportunity to give a, send a message to the whole world, really, that there are many things that we can do as individuals to bolster our own immune health. Um, I'm not saying that even this strengthening and bolstering of our own health can prevent our, the manifestation of the symptoms, even if we get infected with SARS-CoV-2, but it does give your body and your immune system a fighting chance if you give it all the tools that it needs 
to fight off any disease, let alone SARS-CoV-2. So it's just like going into any battle, even if you don't exactly know an enemy and the enemy is evolving, you still want to armor yourself with everything you possibly can before approaching the enemy. So, so there are several things. One thing that has been an unfortunate byproduct from this, from the lockdown situation that many people are, are facing is that though we've been told to stay and stay away from people in large gatherings, we have forgotten that we could still step outside, even just our front doors, wherever that might be. Um, honestly, even a mere five to seven minutes in the sunlight can activate any vitamin D that we have inside of us, which is a huge component to our immune system and helping us defend against any disease. Um, another thing that's been happening is that because of the lockdown situation and the lockdown mentality, people have been buying a lot of processed foods, a lot of canned goods, a lot of things that really have a diminished nutrient, val uh, nutrient density value. And we actually, in these times, need to be doing the exact opposite. We need to be loading ourselves with um, all the produce, everything that ha is alive basically that has all the nutrients that we need to help our cells defend themselves against any foreign uh, enemy so um that's something that i've seen just in the, in the in the populations that i serve even at work i have found that people have been forgetting they're trying to find things that have a long shelf life but in so doing you're 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 removing the nu nutrient density, nutrient value. So those those are the those are the things I, those, I mean, it, it, they're really basic. I think everybody knows these things in the back of their mind, but in a mode of panic, um, it can be forgotten. So that's a good point, and you link there with um, the whole connection between COVID and uh, nature and the environment. So I'm sure we'll come back to this uh, topic again. Um, and another thing, of course, that panic does is you collect a lot of toilet paper, as we've seen. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, Your Eminence, let's um, talk about medic medicine here. Um, uh, you, with all that we see and hear, people have become more exposed to issues related to public health. But can you help us understand the difference between public health and medical ethics or bioethics? Sure. Thank you, Father John, for the question. And uh, it's a great honor uh, to have been invited to join this uh, auspicious group of panelists and others before us um, and to join a fellow terrier, uh, Boston Terrier over there across the digital screen. Uh, go be you. Um, yeah, so I've, <laughs> I have to give a plug out for our, our, our alma mater. I, I think... Um, you're right, I think everyone nowadays um, uh, has developed a, a specialized set of vocabulary words and terms and, and, and principles and ideas b based on what we're reading and, and hearing on uh, the news. And um, so we understand a little bit more what public health is um, than, than last year, I would say. But maybe we can look at the different the, maybe similarities between public health and bioethics and kind of differences um so similarities uh both of these um fields um engage in numerous other specialized fields uh they're interdisciplinary they they include dialogue with science uh, medicine ethics law theology and so forth technology so it, it, you know, in, in many ways, bioethics is not just a single uh, discipline. It's not just math or um, you know, hard science. It includes everything and so does public health. Um, but they're very different in that bioethics often focuses much more on um, how developments in medicine and science impact primarily an individual. Um, you know, how um, or developments, for example, in um, organ donation impact a patient who's looking for an organ um, or a person who's 
potentially a donor of organs. Um, whereas public health, the, the, the main focus is not on an individual, um, but on the community. Um, and the community is often defined in different ways. A community can be, for example, a series of or a set of employees of a factory in one uh, region. Um, it could be one neighborhood, in the individuals who live in one neighborhood. It can be individuals who live in a town or a city or a, a region or a state or a country. Or, I mean, in, in our case today with uh, COVID-19, I mean, we're looking at the global community. Um, and so how these developments in science, medicine, diseases, um, pharma, pharma, pharmacology, how all of these developments and advances and challenges affect uh, more than just one person, but the whole, the community. Um, and so I would say th those are the, the two main uh, differences and, and those are some similarities between bioethics uh, and public health. Thank you. So we've talked briefly about sort of health and then about public health and bioethics. George, let's briefly introduce um, mental health issues here. You've been doing a lot of research recently at the Danielson Institute about the effects of COVID-19 on individuals and on the community. What are some of the unique pressures that you've found, the unique stresses that the pandemic and public health situation impose on individuals or families or communities? Thank you for the question, Father John. And I too uh, feel such a, a sense of privilege being with this, uh, you know, this wonderful group of panelists um, and co-representing Boston University with his eminence. So, uh, in the mental health community and at the Danielson Institute, we're really trying to figure out what those unique things are. And, and we're just getting started because um, the, the pandemic represents a, a kind of insidious, slow moving, relentless trauma that has impacts like a major disaster might, uh, an earthquake or a tsunami, but it has those effects worldwide. And what we're seeing is that some of those effects, they serve as accelerants or amplifiers for vulnerability, especially in persons, families, and communities who have pre-existing vulnerabilities around mental health. You know, we see that with communities of color. We see that around socioeconomic economic, um, factors. We certainly see it in sexual and gender minorities. Um, in many countries, women are suffering in greater numbers and in different ways than men. Um, so there's that, that social part of its impact that, that is affecting mental health. But there are also some of the things that were mentioned earlier, and there's there are occupational vulnerabilities built into this uh, mental health picture around the pandemic. With frontline workers in the health industry, the food industry, um, at the Danielson Institute, we work closely with chaplains from around the world in support groups and hear from them the intense pressures that they face as the numbers of ill and dying people that they have to try to minister to, as well as to their families, increases to un, unsustainable, unservable numbers. And so they, along with the healthcare workers that, that they are working side by side with, are describing almost like a moral injury, which is a, 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 a word that, a phrase that's being used more in, in trauma um, treatment, because they can't possibly do what it is they're trained to do and have to make awful choices about leaving the side of someone who's dying or never getting to the side of someone uh, who's dying or ministering to their families, much like uh, healthcare workers have to make those decisions. So it's this insidious trauma worldwide that has huge disparities in who it's affecting and the most vulnerable are the most affected. Right, right. 
Let me uh, just interrupt the questions that I had to ask you because we're getting a, a number of questions, uh, interesting questions coming in. And um, these are about the vaccine. Um, one is addressed to Sandra. I don't know whether you want to answer or not. And I also have a question for his eminence on the vaccine. Um, so to Sandra, the question was, what's the best vaccine? We have Moderna, we have AstraZeneca, we have Pfizer. That's what's available, at least in our country. Um, in other countries, there's several others, including a Chinese one in Europe um, and other parts of the world. What would you say is the best one? And if I could just address the question to his eminence so that um, you can both be thinking about this. Um, with regard to the vaccine, where is it here? Would his eminence be able to talk about the various vaccines and how some are made either ethically or not ethically? Um, what do you have to comment on that? Sandra, would you like to start? Sure. Um... Very interesting question. I can tell you, though, that the studies on all three, um, as far as efficacy goes, if that's what the question is geared towards, um, they're all very, very similar, maybe within one percentile difference as far as eff efficacy goes. Um, I can tell you from my own personal opinion, the AstraZeneca one just has less um, storage requirements um, and, and uh, temperature requirements. So in my mind, when I'm thinking of cold chain supply and making sure that a vaccine is stored at the correct temperature from beginning to end, especially in transit and how long it's not frozen or the refrigeration requirements, all that AstraZeneca just makes me a little bit ner less nervous in that regard, just in storage requirements alone. But everything else, they're, they're very, very, very similar. Good, thank you. And we heard that just today, actually, of the the huge traffic jam in Oregon where, you know, cars were lined up for miles in the snow. And um, there was the um, example of um, w one van that was filled with uh, vials of the Pfizer, uh, vac I think it was the Pfizer vaccine, um, or Moderna, I think it was Pfizer. And, um, and they decided to go out and basically give it to the people that felt exactly. they were comfortable about receiving it in order that, you know, it wouldn't be wasted because exactly. they, would, they would be late by the time um, they it got to their destination. Exactly. Um, Your Eminence, what about the question addressed to you about the, uh, the way the vaccines are created? Um, thank you, Father John. I, I, and so because I have access to the questions through the webinar platform, I, I, I tried to look at the question a little bit um, and and I, if I'm not mistaken, the person is asking um, specifically um, about the use of aborted, it says aborted fetus line in right. it. So, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm assuming that's what it, the question is related to, whether if it's ethical, ethical to use it or moral uh, to use it or acceptable. Um, I will, I will just say before answering that I, I have been vaccinated. Um, I don't know, I, and, and I don't know if, um, I believe Gail Walashek was one of the former uh, previous panelists, right, and right. I think that she might have been able to speak to this in terms of the science and, you know, the stem, the, 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 the cell line and when, where it originated and how in the history of it and, and where we are today with them. I think many people are concerned uh, because if there is a vaccine, whether it's, I, I don't know which one uh, in question um, is using this line, uh, um, but if there, if it's a COVID vaccine that's using this or any other vaccine for that matter, or any other um, pharmaceutical product um, that uses this line, I mean, the question is, should we be utilizing it? Uh, should we be participating in, I guess, by extension, potentially an abortion? Are we um supporting abortion if we are accepting the fruits of abortion and those are questions that i know many people are, are asking and they're uh it's reasonable and acceptable for our people to ask those questions um i first of all i i would just say you know vaccination uh, the best uh, especially in the united states when it's voluntary you have the best 
likelihood of success. I mean, you have less fear. When people um, are able to say, I, I, I would like to get vaccinated or I'm not ready to get vaccinated when they're not coerced or compelled to get vaccinated, it, it, it's, it's good. Um, if people were compelled or for, you know, coerced to get vaccinated and there was this issue of the, the aborted uh, cell line, it would be even worse. Um, so people now at least have a choice. And so the question is, should we do it? Um, I, I don't know that um, I will be able to please anyone on the ideological um, uh, sphere um, where, where, they, where they are with abortion. Abortion, as we know, is a tragedy. It's um, trauma. It is the uh, death of an unborn child and the church sees that as a sin. Um, and it's even more tragic that we are at this point using such um, tragedy to bring about something good. I mean, it shows the human condition. Um, I, I, if it were in an ideal world, we would never have to use such um, cell lines. We would never uh, have abortions even. But this is right now, this is the world we are living in. And I think that there are so many things that we um, enjoy in life that are connected to tragedies and, tra and, and trauma and sin. It's, and I think we, we live in, in a society, especially in the United States, where abortion and certain issues are overly focused. I mean, there's such an overemphasis on some issues. Abortion is one of them. It's a hot button issue. It's, it's discussed all the time, especially before elections and so forth. So I understand why this is one of those times we're looking at it. But there are many things that we enjoy. Um, and I know that many of the Halki summits have talked about that, you know, how uh, the things that we enjoy in, you know, life that are actually the result of abuses of the environment, the abuse of our neighbors. I mean, how many times do we hear about, you know, the things that we enjoy that were the result of the, the dehumanization of our neighbor? So, I mean, we're talking about a, a child that was aborted and it's a sin and it's a tragedy and, and it's horrific that we are even in a, in a place where we are creating something positive out of that. But I, I, um, I definitely would not judge anyone. I, I encourage people not to judge others for getting vaccinated and to consider them as participants in abortion. That, that is not what the spirit of our canon canonical tradition would speak to. You would never ever, I mean, there shouldn't be any spiritual father out there giving a penance, a severe penance, um, you know, associated with abortion when someone is getting vaccinated and using this type of vaccine. I mean, we should not confuse the two. Right. It's yeah. definitely, uh, and, and I apologize, I kind of felt like I needed to speak a little bit more about this because it's not a yes or no answer. It's very nuanced. It's a very difficult question and our people are struggling with it and we should struggle to give answers. Um, and, I, and I don't know if I, if I even provided a, a- No, you did. And I'm glad you took it so seriously because I think it is on a lot of people's minds and it's important to say that there's more than just a very simple approach or response. Um, George, there's um, a question that's been asked of you as well. Um, Let's see if I can find it here. For Dr. Stavros, do you see more than an anxiety, but an almost psychotic running away from the reality of this pandemic? Do you think this lies behind psychological attempts to deny or diminish the pandemic or attitudes, behavior that ag aggresses against pandemic health measures and treatment? Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I think we as human beings have, have been endowed with a spectacularly efficient alarm system in our brains. Uh, it's, it's called the limbic system. It's, it operates faster than thought, if you will, or what we think of as thought. It's faster than our conscious decision-making or our awareness. It's, it's actually 
about a half second faster. So we've already decided if something is scary before we know we've decided it. With something as insidious and constant as a pandemic that has lethality associated with it, that has fears of contamination associated with it, that also gets fed by a whole bunch of different narratives uh, in the media, some helpful, some not so helpful. It, it taps into that alarm system that we all have. And people, you know, our, our tendency is to do whatever we can to escape the discomfort of our fear. There are really healthy ways to do that. There are healthy ways to get good information, to in, engage in, in things like uh, Sandra was talking about, just healthy diet, um, getting out in the sunlight, moving, you know, somatic embodied things. But when, when that alarm system in us, when the limbic system is triggered by a constant low grade trauma that just doesn't go away, we get into territory that, that's unusual from a mental health perspective. And what can happen is the, there'll be a combination, as I understand it, of, of three things. There's a great need to, to act in the face of the fear. And our, our limbic system comes with some ready ways. They're, they're called fight, flight, freeze or numbing out and appease. So th those, those behaviors come as, as natural endowments to us. Um, in, the, in the face of that need, then there's often uh, a narrative that goes along with the need. We need an explanation. We need meaning to go along with why we're afraid and what we can do to take control of the fear. And the third element then, the third N is a network. There needs to be a network that supports the narrative that's addressing the need. And the reality is right now, there are pockets where those three things converge that are very anti-vaccine and anti-mask and almost anti-COVID where, you know, I wouldn't call it psychotic um, in, the, in the clinical sense, but it's, it departs so far from good scientific information. And we, we can wonder why it's the case, but it has that need narrative network convergence happening and we wanna get away from our fear. Good point, thank you. Uh, Sandra, let me turn to you again and um, to tell us something from your own experience, uh, your own public health experience. How has that influenced your response to the COVID-19 pandemic? What did you learn from previous deployments, for instance, that you feel can be applied to the contemporary situation of COVID-19? Sure, um, yeah, so definitely. Uh, I mean, I've, I've deployed for some natural disasters, including Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and other hurricanes um, in the aftermath to help those communities. But of course, you know, the, the most, relatable deployment was the one to um, West Africa and Liberia uh, for the Ebola outbreak. Um, actually, something very interesting that I um, gained from that experience really was just, um, it's very simple, but the donning and the doffing process of PPE in which, you know, all of us are now wearing, right? Mask is considered personal protective equipment. So all of us are wearing it. Sometimes we don't realize the way we put on a mask and the way we take it off actually can, can be a place where infection happens. So a lot of times we'd, if we're just like, you know, ripping a mask off or just throwing a mask on that we have, if, if, if it's a disposable one that hasn't been washed or anything, you know, the way that we put um, PPE on and take off really does matter. We don't think about our hands having contaminants and we're putting a mask on and we're putting the mask on on our face and in the exact places where the entryways where the virus can can come and inf infect us so that was something because we actually we had to train for seven days straight before we went to africa just on taking on and putting off ppe so that was something that was huge to me i was trying to give 
small tutorials to my friends and family. Just make sure it, it's very important to think about this. It's hard also, especially now we're in a place where we've been doing this for 10 months, day in and day out, in between errands, in between okay. so many things. So it's very hard. It becomes something that you have to be very cognizant of and very conscientious of because it's now it's like second nature to most of us, I would say. Okay. And that doing was... the wrong thing can become second nature too. Exactly, so, exactly. Um, Sandra, I want to continue with you because we have a question. I don't normally say names of people who are on, and a lot of them are anonymous anyway, but we have um, one of the most prominent, I'd say, physicists and scientists in our country uh, watching and listening in. Um, where is he? Amory Lovins wanted to ask you a question. I'm hoping he hasn't taken it down. Maybe he has. I did respond did you see to that? Are you may have responded? Lovins, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so did you want to say what that was about? Just, sure, uh, yeah. Um, yes, Mr. Lovins was um, alluding to the fact that he also recognized that since the pandemic has started, this messaging of being outside, restorative sleep, uh, appropriate supplementation, those, those, that general messaging of, of bolstering and strengthening your own immune system has been largely missed from the media. And because it hasn't been covered by the biggest, you know, public health gurus in certain circles, um, the journalists and editors won't cover it, won't publish it, won't put it in the media. And he's, he was acknowledging that it was a massive, massive miss um, on the general public's uh, mm -hmm. part. So I just was agreeing with his sentiments. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. George, what about your experience from your surveys, from your contact with uh, people in, at the Institute? Do you feel that there are specific factors that are associated with greater well-being or resilience during this pandemic? I think I think some things are starting to to show themselves and rise to the top, and, and they're not like uh, they're fairly intuitive. Um, the effects of of the pandemic are so in in certain ways anti relational. They go against the grain of of the basic impulses and needs and and makeup of who we are as as social beings. That any any way any creative ways people are finding to remain connected to others, including these electronic ones, but uh, connection with others that, that takes an extra step seems to be something that's associated with uh, increased well-being and resilience. Um, a few other things that have emerged from research that we've done with our patient population. So, you know, these are folks that, that come to an outpatient mental health clinic in Boston. Um, is if they're able to, to identify and, and kind of follow through on a sense of meaning and purpose, even in the midst of all these changed circumstances. And interestingly, a lot of that has to do with identifying some way to offer themselves in the context of the pandemic, some sense of uh, active altruism, volunteer work, things that they can pick up and do that, that feel like it, it gives some sense of agency amidst what can feel like a very uh, helpless situation at times. Um, some people are creating, uh, are going into more expanding their creative outlets um, musically, uh, cooking, just being active, uh, finding ways to do that that may not have been in place before because they weren't as necessary. Uh, a big one that showed up in one of our, our recent pieces of research was connection with nature. People who were getting outside in ways that they hadn't before particularly into, uh, you know, more natural settings, forests, parks, oh, well. there, uh, you know, the, what we do is, is we ask what kinds of activities people are engaging in and then weigh that against their, you know, their symptom picture. And people who are demonstrating more well-being, le they're less symptomatic, they're, they're 
you know, they're doing better in the context. A big group of them were people who were getting outside more than they had, had been. One other one that, that's a little hard to describe, but it actually showed up pretty importantly, was people who were learning to negotiate personal space that had been changed or compromised in the context. So lots of families, lots of people working from home, going to school at home, living at home, closed in, different kinds of space. Um, lots of people going to the grocery store and feeling uncomfortable with close proximity and not being sure how to navigate that. The ones who, who were finding their way in that actual physical movement through the world and negotiating it also were demonstrating some more resilience. Very interesting. I think uh, we've all learned to use uh, the least usable parts of our homes, the basements, the attics, uh, the closets. Um, and I always think that the, 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 the ones that made out well with this coronavirus are uh, not, you know, particular professions or particular, you know, um, segments of society, but um, pets. Pet dogs in particular have never had their owners home so much and been able to go out on so many walks as during this pandemic. Um, Sandra, um, how does our individual health and well-being impact the health and well-being of those around us and the well-being of the small part of the world that we live in? Wow, what a question. Um, I think, I think if, if nothing else, and I actually think Dr. Stavros has alluded to this, um, I, I think that what we, if nothing else in this pandemic, I hope that we've realized that how we are as individuals as far as our health is, both physically and mentally and spiritually, truly affects our neighbor. And this is something, you know, as Orthodox believers, that this is something that's very strong in our faith, that we are one body with all of humanity. And and so it, it is, we have just, we've grown into this society, into this people who have learned to be siloed um, and maybe siloed in smaller units, perhaps in our family units or our close friends or whatever we may call our unit. Um, but even still, it can be distilled down to the individual. And we need to move away from that because if I'm feeling well, I'm going to support people well in my community and, and vice versa. But if all of us are sick, all of us are not at the, you know, the potential of right. energy and liveliness that we could be, it's going to affect not only each other, but also the environment around us. That's true. Your Eminence, let's uh, look at the role of the church now, uh, because this is, I think, one of the emphases of this summit. Um, what are some of the tenets, some of the basic teachings of the Orthodox Church that can help us understand, uh, well, public health initiatives generally, or the science behind them, uh, especially as these relate to COVID-19? Sure. So I think um, I mentioned earlier the the you know public health. There's in public health there's a, a strong emphasis on the community on on what's good for the broader community versus an individual only. Um, that that um, there's also especially in the United States health and in public health initiatives is you know the balance between mandates and liberty. I mean, in, in our country has been established because of the need to be more free. Uh, liberty is very important to our people here. And so public health, especially in the United States, places a lot of emphasis on, on respecting one's um, liberty, even though we're looking to um, advance the wellness of the general uh, community. Um, and so with that, I would say that we have some key theological teachings that we can mine and kind of unearth and, and utilize and try and understand, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and other public health initiatives um, today and tomorrow. And those include our theology, our Trinitarian theology, understanding 
you know, one God, three persons, this, this harmony, this, this, this unity of love, um, our theology of the Eucharist and, and Holy Communion and our um, uh, connection to God, uh, becoming one with him, um, uh, our connection to each other, our connection even to the entire world, you know, Eucharistic theology that looks at a cosmic view of, uh, of communion is important when thinking about the community and how sacred the community is. Um, I also think that uh, a very important uh, theological teaching that we speak about all the time, but we don't know how to um, express on an uh, everyday uh, day basis is our theology of the image of God in each other. And that Imago Dei uh, means that the person I'm looking at and interacting with um, it has that sacredness that is in, that's found in God. They're imbued with it. And so it helps us understand, you know, my responsibility toward that person, how my actions affect that person, um, as uh, the lieutenant was uh, alluding to earlier. Um, I also think, you know, our theology of freedom. I mean, obviously, we, it's a great gift from God, freedom and free will, but it's also limited. It's, it, you know, in exercising free will, it's, there's always that element of weakness and, and the human condition is always present in the exercise of free will. We're not coerced by God to do anything, but when we do decide to do something, there's always that element of maybe I'm falling short of that, um, the, the, the holiness. And so when talking about liberty, there, maybe there is no such thing as absolute liberty. You know, we're never completely free. We're always um, in need of someone else. And so I, I would say that those theological principles can help us understand uh, and appreciate what public health is trying to do a little bit more. Well, let me press that issue a little further because we had some questions about advice that people receive from spiritual elders or monastics in particular. Um, uh, 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 so I'm following how, on. How, how, about, how about spiritual married priests? Uh, they give advice too, but <laughs> actually all of them give good and bad advice. I actually okay. give a lot, bit of, a lot of bad advice, but tell me okay. when you're speaking of freedom and things like that, um, what happens when monastics or spiritual elders, anyone giving spiritual advice, um, and it might be people that have been canonized, people like, you know, Father Paisios, um, who are reserved towards vaccinations or towards science or medicine. How should people read those uh, uh, teachings or hear that advice or respond to it? I think um, when we read the early church fathers or the modern church fathers, um, we, it, if we read anything they write as absolute truths and absolutely correct in an absolute scientific way, um, we're always going to be uh, misled. I mean, we're going to miss the point of their writings. We're going to miss the essence, the spirit of what they're trying to convey. Um, I mean, there are things that are scientifically inaccurate, even in the scriptures. I mean, the, sci the, the Holy Bible is not a, sci a medical book. It's not a, a textbook for science or physics or, 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 any, or any other science uh, field. So I think if we're if we're reading them and saying, aha, now I know, look, Elder Paisios said this about vaccines, therefore all vaccines are bad, um, I can't take them, or all vaccines are good for that matter. I mean, whatever they say, I mean, we can't approach them for scientific truths necessarily. They weren't trained in that. They were they were holy men and women who prayed and um, struggled um, to be in union and communion with God and their neighbor. And, and I think what they were writing was an effort to try to help guide people. But I also think that we have many people who are doing the same thing today that are not canonized or who may not even be Orthodox, who mean well, who want to help, help you know, want to help help people. Um, they're trying their best. And I think that it's, it's appropriate to 
read the fathers of the church. It's necessary to read them, but I would not read them for uh, understanding modern science. I would read them for, you know, eternal truths about, you know, the revelation of God, our relationship with God, you know, and so forth. And so I, 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 I think it's wrong if, if that's what advice we're getting from elders about, you know, medicine that is based on these types of writings. I'd, I'd say people are being misled in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. That's very pastoral response and spiritual response on your behalf. And I'm very grateful for that. Sorry for throwing all the difficult questions at you this evening. Um, <laughs> again, I would probably go further than you and say there are pieces of advice and teachings um, uh, among contemporary spiritual elders that are simply wrong, more than just misleading, um, and outrightly outrageous. So, and yeah, I mean, look, we, we can go into that and maybe, you know, there, there is a need to discuss those in depth, but I don't want to, um, you know, without pointing out examples of that, and I don't have those examples in front of me, I don't want to just give the uh, uh, impression that all, all of the, this advice that's coming out from modern elders is, is wrong. But I think people know when something is wrong. I mean, they, they know it in their heart. It's wrong. If many people say it's wrong, it's wrong. I mean, I, I don't know how else to... Uh, Let, let's stay on this issue of um, prayer then and holiness and um, the role of religion. George, what for you is the role of spirituality or faith in the context of the pandemic in, in your own work? So our mission at the Danielson Institute is to really look closely at the connection between mental health and spirituality, seeing ways in which it, it's a resource, oftentimes central to people's lives, and also appreciating ways in which it can be used destructively or self-destructively. A colleague of ours, uh, Ken Pargament, who's at Bowling Green University, in some of his research and clinical work, ended up uh, landing on a concept that he that he coined sacred moments and what he meant by sacred moments were experiences that people were describing within which um, they saw a, a larger existence a larger world than they had been aware of before um, in in uh, the patriarch's opening address there was, uh, there was a part of his uh, presentation where he said, we need to discover a dimension of depth in all things. I think in a way that relates to people's experiences of sacred moments and the ways in which I, you know, I think from the, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, we would understand human beings as having been created to experience sacred moments because they're always available. It's, it's a way of, you know, we try to learn to open ourselves up to them rather than somehow seek them out as if they're buried treasure, that they're happening all the time. And our, our noose is the, the organ within us, the, the eye of our soul to take in and really experience the word of God in the world in the ways that, that we're able to do. And that looks different for everybody because each of us has our own developmental history. Each of us has our own refined alarm system that's, you know, that's gonna see certain things as novel and certain things as frightening, but we're made to experience these sacred moments. Well, in Ken's research, he actually goes so far as to say, sacred moments are a vaccine, his word, for trauma. People who are, are experiencing these kinds of sacred moments do not suffer the same kind of deleterious effects from traumatic events that people who do not. Let me give just a couple examples of what sacred moments could be, and they can be as mundane as anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, the transfiguration on Mount Tabor in order for it to make a difference. Um, Things like, I was talking with a client of mine today who got to see his grandson for the first time this week and they got to go on a walk together. And his grandpa or his grandson kept 
using his name to get his attention. And as they walk down the sidewalk, hand in hand, the man that I was talking to said his, his heart burst open with joy and a kind of sweet sadness because everything else fell away. It was just the two of them together. Interesting, beautiful. Um, I was talking with some colleagues recently who just were in a, a hard place with, they've been working for months and months in difficult spaces around a lot of trauma with, with clients. And somehow they got to sharing poetry with each other in this meeting rather than continuing the clinical discussions. And each poem took the group to a completely other place where by the end of it, each of these people felt like they were ready to go back into the, the difficult spaces again because what had been weighing them down fell away. Their, the scales fell from their eyes. Sacred moments. And what, what I, I actually, I buy into this. I think we need to, to continue to look at it, but I think there's probably a way in which the church has been saying forever that this is the way life should be. And this actually is the way we protect ourselves from the, the difficulties of life in a world that can be brutal and, you know, can really dish out a lot of pain. These vaccinating moments uh, are things we should all be looking not only to cultivate and open ourselves up to, but to to practically teach this to each other how to how to do this. That's very beautiful. A lot of people during this period have talked about the connection between quarantine and uh, Lent, um, where you abstain from certain things and you end up appreciating things a lot more. Even an egg looks good after forty days of fasting. Um, Sandra, I'd like to ask you what role you feel uh, your faith and uh, prayer play in your own work. Well, um, I I just see, see it as an essential piece to my normal healthcare regimen. I mean, I to me, it's it's the beginning, the middle, and the end of all actions that we do. Um, and and specifically, I, I've learned to lean on prayer um, more because of my deployments. Um, I I had a very interesting situation when I was deploying to Liberia because everybody I knew was against me going, and was thinking it was a suicide mission. And you know, and I really had to. I that was a time where that I that feeling of isolation that I had in this call that I really felt was from God. Um, the communication that we had, um, me and God, <laughs> during that time helped me cultivate even a stronger, it's like a positive feedback loop, basically. And in the midst of unknown, um, we are, we are telling, we, we have this huge opportunity to tell God that we want to continue to eat of the tree of life, not the tree of knowledge of what's good and what's bad for me and my life, even though most of, I mean, all of my work is science-based and there is a lot of knowledge involved in that, but I have learned to um, put that aside at times, not, not ignoring it, but just also remembering who is the creator of that knowledge. Um, and I, if I'm not in communication with him, I won't even be able to interpret correctly evidence-based medicine. So that, that my, my spiritual my relationship with the Holy Trinity has has really helped me actually become a better scientist and a better responder in times of need um, because he knows all and has all facets of all people in his mind and in his heart. And so I, it has helped. I mean, I, I can't do anything related to public health without his guidance. Yeah. Wow. So it seems, and both George and you have said this, that, uh, Sort of the intensity of um, the the crisis uh, attracts a proportional intensity of grace, and we say that in our prayers as well. That the abyss of our darkness sort of invokes the the depth of God's uh, loving grace. Uh, I remember 
that when my elder son was born prematurely, very prematurely, the, the intensity of prayer uh, during that period was uh, like nothing I've experienced in a long time. Uh, or something, since we're talking about elders and saints and monks, Father Paisios may or may not have been a good scientist, but he certainly knew the spiritual world very well. And I remember him telling me once that when you're in a dark room, the darker the room is, in fact, you appreciate and you can see, you can discern the light much more clearly. It's almost as if God's vision is like the vision of an owl. Um, Your Eminence, I wonder if I can turn to you and ask what you think we've learned as Christians or as believers from this whole experience of the pandemic. Yeah, I, by the way, I want to I wanted to just say how humbled I I was to hear the lieutenant speak about her relationship with God and how I mean how awesome that is um, to hear. I mean, it, it, I'm still thinking about what she said and um, so I, I appreciate that, um, uh, Sandra, thank you. Um, in terms of um, the, um, I think what we've learned is, I think, I think we can write a textbook about what we've learned <laughs> um, and, and what we refuse to learn. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, I think obviously one thing as a church, we, we need to be prepared always, always for such moments. The, these crises are gonna happen all the time. This is this was not the first time. It's not going to be the last time, um, and and I and I just want to I want to um, say that we need to be prepared, not necessarily with PPE in the basement and hand sanitizer and so forth, but to help people, as the doctor mentioned, find these um, vaccine moments, or as he said, I don't recall what the the the, the term was, but. I think th th those are so important. And so we, uh, we need to help people deal with the, the stress and pressures of life, whatever they may be. Um, but we, we definitely need to be prepared for more of these types of pandemics, um, whether they're global or regional or, or localized um, in, a, in, a, in a specific city. Um, and we can do that, obviously. I mean, I, I look at it from a metropolitan standpoint, you know, we have parishes that are struggling um, uh, with a lot of different things. And, 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 you know, we need to find a way to help um, sustain our communities. We need to deviate and move away from kind of transactional stewardship and start to understand the value of the church in our lives. And I think we've learned that with this pandemic during the last year of how valuable Christ is in our lives, the church, our parish community, and therefore we must sustain it ourselves. We cannot rely on anyone else. We've been very lucky to get PPP money for our communities and so forth, but you know, that may not happen again. And, and we've got to be committed to support from the grassroots, our parishes. Um, I, another thing is, you know, we've learned how important relationships are. Every single relationship matters. I mean, people, we, we've heard people say they're becoming stir crazy. They, they're in the house or cooped up. They, you know, the only person they have to talk to sometimes is just through a door. You know, people who visit and people haven't been able to open their door to speak to someone face to face. Our relationships need, we can't take for granted the relationships we have with each other. Every single person matters in our lives. You know, love your enemy is a challenge to face your enemy, to look at them. And, and, and that person matters in our lives. Um, I think we've also learned of how low our, the religious literacy of our people is. I mean, we, our people's understanding and appreciation and experience, li, you know, living the faith is very low. Um, and therefore they become very vulnerable to you know false you know theology pseudoscience you know they, they they get pulled in a lot of different polarizing i would say even political ideologies 
they they hold on to that more than the faith because they don't know the faith. Um, we have a lot of fundamentalism being advanced in our communities because people don't know the faith. Because they don't know the faith, they don't know how to respond in a way that can enlighten others, who, that can inspire others around them, who, that can bring others to Christ, that can give them hope. If we don't know the faith, we can't live the faith, and therefore we can't be that vaccine that our neighbor needs. So we need to definitely do more about teaching the faith so that people can live the faith more authentically every single day. So I think that's what I can say those three things, be prepared, value your relationships and learn the faith and then live the faith. Thank you, Eminence. I wonder <clears throat> if I can come back to you uh, with your pharmacy background and training. Can you see any relationship between the overuse of prescription medication and its impact on the environment? Yes, Father John, I see a direct correlation with the overuse of prescription medications and the impact on its environment. Um, one very basic way that I think people overlook um, this correlation is honestly, it's actually pharmaceutical waste. So, and what I mean by that is a lot of times when people have a, a bottle of pills that maybe they didn't, they weren't totally compliant with and they didn't finish their regimen and maybe they realized, oh, it was in the back of their medicine cabinet's been there for a year. Normally people will do one of two things. They'll dump the medications in the trash or they'll dump it in the toilet. <laughs> and both, both ways of wasting medications in, um, actually harm the environment. And one thing that we don't realize is even when we dump medications in the in in, in our toilets, it actually ends up getting in our uh, water and in, in tap water. So a lot of people who I know still a very I mean a lot of people drink tap water. I I drink tap water wherever I think I can. Um, I try my best to look to see what the local contaminants are in the water. But I mean. I I did a rotation, I, I won't name this area, but I did a rotation in an area once where um, people knew, it was very publicly known that antidepressants were just something that was found in the local tap water and because of how often it was disposed of improperly. I just, I'll just take this just one, one second to say, if you have any medication, both over the counter or prescription that you need to dispose of, please take it to your local retail pharmacy and they have a, they have a specific box. Well, they, they will dump those medications and they disintegrate it in a very specific medication waste area. So that's, I mean, it's an extra step, but it's, uh, if you're on your way to the grocery store or on the way back from just drop those meds off and don't toss them in the in the garbage bin it gets in landfills and it also contaminates the air and the land and the soil it's it's a whole it's it, it's something that is, i think is overlooked but i'm quite passionate about <laughs> Thank you. that's very important i think for people to hear for all of us to hear uh george there's a question addressed to you here it sounds like the mental impact it sounds like the mental impact of the pandemic, the three factors that you mentioned of fight and flight and is similar to other historical events of, you know, tragedy. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about survivors, traumatized segments of populations after the world wars and so on. The mental health of those groups was compromised in many communities, especially ethnic ones. Are there any, any lessons to be learned from those times that church communities can employ to assist their vulnerable groups today? Mm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think churches may be ideally positioned to play a huge role in the healing that needs to take place emotionally and spiritually coming out of the pandemic. I mean, what we know about, what we know about trauma on an individual basis is that the jolt that the limbic system takes is hot and high and fast. We, we, it has to be that way because it's pre preparing us to respond to a life-threatening danger. 
that can actually be, that's a good analogy for what happens to communities too. We've mobilized, this whole planet has mobilized in a stunningly powerful, fast way, maybe not so efficient and not as effective as it needed to be, but massive mobilizations have taken place across the entire globe. That's, that's good and I, you know, I, hopefully that's gonna get us out of the acuity of the health situation. What we also know about trauma though, is it cools off much, much slower, five to 10 times slower than, than it ratchets up. And so the effects of this uh, collective global trauma are gonna be with us for a long time as they, as they were after the world wars and the communities uh, particularly affected. In some of the countries where, where uh, you know, the, the violence and damage was at its worst, it, it's still being healed. I mean, we're talking about generations of healing. That's, I think that's where churches just doing what churches do best are positioned to provide exactly what human beings need to heal from trauma. People aren't always going to be and often aren't ready to, to talk about the trauma. We need ritual. We need symbols. We need rhythm. We need music. We need good, gentle, simple music. We need iconography. We need sensory input that our liturgical life gives us. We need fellowship. We need, you know, communal efforts to help others. All, all these things bind together the combination of rhythm and relationship that is absolutely necessary to heal both personal and communal trauma. I don't, I don't know anywhere else that's better set up to do it if we do it the way that we can. Thank you. I think that's bringing us to the closing sort of uh, points that I would like to um, address to his eminence um, with regard to what families can be doing, what parents and children can be doing to strengthen their spiritual life, to um, to stay in communion with the rest of the church at a time of lockdown when they can't attend church or when so few can attend church, or when people can't take communion, or when people are not sure how to take communion, what would you say are the sorts of things that we still have to be dealing with until you know most of us are vaccinated? Um, how can we uh, boost our spiritual life during lockdown? <laughs> That's... That's um, a loaded question, and it's a, it, it, there's a there's a lot I guess that one can offer. Um, I, I, you know, when when this when we first started uh, the lockdown, um, there was an automatic I think resistance or, or effort to try to fight this. You know, I I want this. It's my church. Why can't I have what I believe I'm entitled to? or as a baptized, chrismated Orthodox Christian should have access to. I, I mean, that was the immediate reaction of our people in many ways. And, and, and again, I understand it more now. I mean, it, we were all shocked uh, with when this first happened. This um, was and new territory for everyone. Very, very new territory for everyone. I mean, including the church and the people of the church. So, you know, everyone was responding in different ways. And I think this was one of the reactions early on. And, you know, I remember having conversations with, with others. You, you, you participated in a conversation with people and we we're trying to give people the understanding, like, oh, look, we're entering Lent. This is a part of the Lenten monastic tradition. We go out, we stay away from, we abstain from even the Eucharist and then come back. And I think we, people were thinking this would be over by Pascha. Um, and then people kept thinking this would be over by Pentecost and then by the summer and then Memorial Day. And then and we don't know when this will be over and, 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 and we don't know when it will start up again. And, and the truth is uh, people go through lockdowns or, or feel alone at various times in their lives. 
not just during a global pandemic, um, when they feel isolated or th that they can't approach the Eucharist or can't approach their uh, their their fellow community members, uh, they feel lost. And in in this case, you know, I I, I think that one of the the greatest exercises that we can try to build up our spiritual muscles for the rest of the pandemic and for future pandemics or for whenever we feel alone is to look for God in all things. Look for ways to express love and receive love. I, I am so impressed by our young people who are going out there calling the, the elders, delivering groceries, doing little things, those little things, you know, helping to feed the hungry, you know, those, those acts, the, those are spiritual acts. I mean, we don't have to do metanias and do an all night vigil to say that we're building up our, our souls and our spiritual lives. I mean, these are all acts of love. And so I would say with your children, speak to them about love. Talk to them about when you have fallen in love, when you have fought with someone that you were in love and how you, 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 you came back and build that bridge again to look at them in the face, talk to them about love, show them what love looks like, help them express it in their own way every day in school, on the way to the, the grocery store, whatever they're doing, if it's a little bit now, Find a way to introduce agapi in their lives. And I think that that will help us all. I mean, that will, you know, they, they may say something that helps lift their, the, the, the child that's sitting next to them that's, that's having a rough time at home. So teach them to love now more than ever. So that's, that's what I would say. And every parent and every family can do that in a different way. And each of us adults can do that in a different way. Thank you. You've all underlined that, and that's a, a good point at which to close. You've, uh, George, you spoke of the sacred <laughs> moments, and uh, Sandra, you spoke of finding God in the most difficult moments. So I'm very grateful for um, your time and the very gracious responses that you gave this evening to very difficult questions. I'd say more difficult questions, uh, more personal questions uh, than those of the previous two nights. So that brings to a close our third and final webinar of Halki Summit 4. Let me thank each and every one of our viewers from all over the world. I do want to apologize to viewers in Europe for the awkwardness of the time. We had to make a judgment call very early on and decided that trying to look for a suitable time for everyone in the world would probably ultimately on, only render the time inconvenient for everyone in the world. We still had over 1,200 registrations for just the Zoom um, conference itself and over 2,500 live viewers on the Patriarchate's Facebook at any given time. I'm very grateful to everyone for their interest and their participation. My special thanks to the speakers this evening. Um, special appreciation for the hard work behind the scenes of my colleagues, Nicholas Anton and Spiridula Fotinis, and a humble closing expression of gratitude to His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, for his visionary leadership, his long-standing commitment to protecting the environment and addressing climate change. Without him, none of this would be possible. Good night.